Um, I think we're, we're virtually opening the door and letting everyone into, um, into uh, this session of Peace Week. Um, and I'm Jeff Helsing. I'm the executive director of the Better Evidence Project at the Carter School uh, at George Mason University. And uh, we're delighted to uh, host this session, which is focusing on uh, uh, local uh, peacemaking initiatives, um, the importance, the value of local peacemaking initiatives. Um, and we're focused this morning, uh, or in the case of our speakers uh, this afternoon, uh, on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And what we're, what we're really doing um, is to try and, and bridge theory and practice, integrating theory and practice so that um, we have um, uh, real um, uh, evidence of peacemaking effectiveness, particularly local initiatives. So that's what we're really interested in highlighting uh, this morning. Um, first of all, <clears throat> Uh, the Peace Week, broadly speaking, is uh, a week-long series of sessions and events sponsored by the Carter School, um, both as a way to highlight uh, interesting work and developments um, in peacemaking, in conflict prevention, uh, but also a way to try and help connect uh, people in the peacemaking field, particularly connecting practitioners, uh, researchers, and scholars uh, as a way to highlight some of the really interesting and effective and impactful work uh, that's going on um, in conflict prevention in peacemaking around the world. So um, this is, uh, we've been doing this on a, um, biannual basis. This is the spring peace week. We also have a fall peace week that's uh, usually at the end of September. So for the Better Evidence Project, this is uh, particularly exciting for us because yesterday we had a session that focused on, on evidence and connecting evidence. And today we're really sort of looking at the, at the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, work on the ground, um, sort of the, the practice, if you will. So with that, we're delighted to have um, three terrific uh, presentations. And uh, we will start off with um, uh, Samuel Awanda and Amina Hassan from Hawenka. And Hawenka is the Horn of Africa Women's Empowerment Network in Kenya. Um, and at the Better Evidence Project, we're, we've been very excited to partner with Hawenka. We provided a, a grant to them to try and distill uh, the lessons learned from their work um, uh, to complement the ongoing efforts to um, uh, reach uh, uh, ways of uh, ending armed conflict and bringing communities together complementing an ongoing peace process. And they'll, uh, Samuel and Amina will talk about the work that they've been doing. Um, and then we will follow up with Charles Davidson, um, who is a research assistant professor here in the Carter School. Um, and he's also the director of the Political Leadership Academy uh, in the Carter School. Uh, but more particularly for um, our interest uh, today, uh, Charles has been working in South Kivu province in the Democratic Republic of Congo with local partners, uh, again, focused on uh, developing uh, agreements to end armed conflict there. Um, and he's gonna talk about some of the initial successes that they have had at the local level um, uh, uh, getting agreements to uh, end, uh, end violence in armed conflict. 
So again, this is an example of sort of taking theory ideas and putting them into practice uh, at, at the local uh, level of peacemaking. And then finally, we'll turn to Emmanuel Bombande, um, who uh, has been a senior mediation advisor for the United Nations in the Central African Republic. Um, and he's going to talk about a particular uh, effort at, again, um, uh, working to end armed conflict uh, in Bangasu in the Central African uh, Republic. Um, Emmanuel also is the, the co-founder of the West African Network for Peacebuilding um, and is a former deputy foreign minister in Ghana. And he, uh, like Charles, uh, like Samuel, who's, who's also a scholar, he combines teaching, scholarship, and practice. And that's very much at the heart of sort of the ethos of the, of the Carter School. Um, we are a school with uh, many practitioners, scholars who combine work on the ground in the field with their teaching and their scholarship. So with that, um, I'm very happy to uh, turn first to uh, Samuel and Amina. Okay, um, thanks Jeffrey and thanks everyone. Uh, we uh, really excited to be part of uh, the Peace Week uh, for this year and to have this opportunity to share the work that we do uh, at Hawenka in, in Kenya and more so in the north, uh, northern part, which is uh, popularly known as the Horn of Africa. Um, our model of presentation uh, shows an action oriented kind of research which starts from practice moving back into theory and so we may not necessarily touch aspects of the theoretical perspectives which are details part that we were proposing in uh, this study uh, so we want to just highlight key uh, success areas of our practice so the session uh, focuses on importance of local peacemaking initiatives and how uh, some kind of outside interveners and even the state uh, can complement rather than to undermine any efforts uh, that occasionally occurs when there is no compatibility on uh, the structural process of interventions. So our case uh, highlights how um, a successful network of indigenous women who are working as mediators in the name of Hawenka as an umbrella body, which Amina will be sharing with us shortly, has managed to strengthen ongoing peace process among differences uh, in ethnic or uh, between ethnic groups in Kenya. And uh, as already Jeffrey had indicated, uh, we were supported by the Better Evidence Project to document lessons from previous work uh, with an eye to developing evidence of the effect effectiveness of our locally facilitated peacemaking efforts. And so as part of our introduction, I would probably give just the context about Kenya and Northern Kenya specifically, uh, where we see conflict situation nuanced in a lot of historical injustices uh, that can be traced back to the colonial times, but have been um, manifested more by the state agencies. And at times it exhibits repetitive patterns of violence that emanate or emerge from competitive victimhood. So in many cases, the communities find themselves taking um, refuge in being victims of historical injustices. And when any of the neighbor uh, communities uh, have any advantage, again, you see an element of competition on who is the worst effective victim. And so ethnic communities find themselves trapped in competing values for protection 
and clashing over resources for survival. Many conflicts in those uh, regions are linked to one, political interests, which are seen as uh, avenues for securing access to resources. And also there are scarce public resources based on government uh, decisions. And so the region consider themselves or is one of the most regions that are marginalized. And so sharing natural resources also become a problem. Uh, it's a semi-arid uh, region that water even for livestock and for humans is a big challenge. And also uh, it's affected by contrasting cultural values as much as uh, they have some uniformity in religion and aspects of uh, ethnic alignment. And so uh, we discuss how local peacemaking initiatives led by this indigenous women, uh, group of women uh, became more uh, successful in areas where international efforts have usually not succeeded well or where the government and the state agencies, despite all their military power, have not managed to create any calmness or peace for that matter. And so who is this Hawenka? What is Hawenka? What does it stand for? And this one, I want to invite my sister Amina to talk about this, Amina. Uh, okay, good afternoon, East African time, um, Jeffrey and uh, colleagues on board. Um, as my colleague Sam has said, um, I'll just go straight on, on what Hawenka is. Uh, um, I ask for your uh, pardon in case you see my speech has some problem. I have a wound on my tongue, so it might interfere with my speech in, once in a while. And Hawenka, uh, which literally means Horn of Africa Women Empowerment Network, Kenyan Agency, is a women welfare organization, oriented organization that was registered in the year December 2010 as an NGO. Formerly, it was a CBO that was known as uh, Women for Peace and Development. A CBO is a community-based organization that was only based in Madeira, though it was working both in Somalia and, and Kenya. I mean, uh, Somalia and Ethiopia and Mandela town. It was established to address the felt needs of women in northeastern region of Kenya and the other, the other two neighboring countries of Somalia and, and Ethiopia in the Horn of Africa who have been marginalized and in the community's mainstream development, uh, in, the, in the community mainstream development programs. Hawenka is an acronym of an umbrella network of grassroots of women peace building organizations in four counties of Northern Kenya, namely Wajia, Garissa, uh, Isielo, and uh, Marsabit, northern part of, uh, upper eastern part of Kenya, and each in Ethiopia and also Somalia. Uh, Mandera uh, neighbors Somalia to the east and Ethiopia to the north. Uh, when you're in Mandera, you're in both all three countries. So we only have a river that, that, that borders Ethiopia and, and Mandera, that is Kenya. And then we have a small strip that borders Somalia and, and Mandera, which is in Kenya also. So Hawenka in Somali language means women. These acronyms brought together meaning Horn of Africa Women Empowerment Network, but in, in, one, in one word, Hawenka means women. That means the organization targets mainly the most vulnerable people uh, in the society, who are the women and the girls. Uh, women for Peace, which was earlier before that, uh, was also a CBO and we have still, we are still carrying forward the name women, which was still there. Thank you. Thank you, Amina, um, for that elaborate discussion. And so, uh, Hawenka, which is Horn of Africa Women Empowerment Network, Kenyan Agency, uh, has worked together with other non-governmental organizations uh, to take lead in peace building at the community level, uh, uh, while sometimes uh, supported by the government, which come in to do uh, some kind of secondary activities. But now, how did we do this study? Uh, we designed it uh, in a phenomenological approach uh, that takes qualitative uh, methods purely. And so we sampled 60 peace actors. 45 being women and 15 men. This was purposely determined because of the focus of our interests and the in-depth uh, interviews were conducted. 
with 15 uh, members of Wenka, 15, uh, 20 members of the NGO partners, 13 members of government agencies, and 12 uh, community leaders, some of whom are religious and uh, elders. Uh, so we aimed at capturing the voice of community actors to extract their local model built on indigenous knowledge towards peace building and to enhance an, uh, uh, much of their experiences and their lived lives on daily basis to see how they apply such kind of traditions that they've lived with in peace building. So uh, some of the uh, results that we got uh, can be traced to assertive activism by the founders of peace building and one of the founding ladies is called Teka Ibrahim and the followers who supported her in this initiative, one of them is Amina Hassan who is with me here. And so the strategies show that um, many of our indigenous uh, activities rely on informal peace building tasks that are often recorded at the lowest point of community conflicts. And so the actors and the activities uh, find themselves facing neg negligible support, sometimes by elders and government agencies, leading to structural exclusion of the local voices of women from the mainstream. But despite these kind of obstacles, uh, the team and the network of women has managed to secure a lot of ground. And so I want to invite Amina to start uh, by introducing the three areas of interventions where uh, they have ventured most as Hawenka, Amina. Uh, thank you, Sam. And as Sam has said, uh, I think as Hawenka and uh, formerly Women for Peace and Development, it was really a big issue for us to interact and penetrate the elders. Uh, as elders always take, the Somali elders always take us, that is their role. The role of peace building, the role of issues to do with conflict management is men's role. It has nothing to do with women. But through Women for Peace, an organization which I initiated myself and started, uh, now that is an NGO, international NGO, uh, we, we, we intervened several ways. We used aggressive methods in terms of in introducing indigenous interventions like trauma healing and social reconciliation, uh, care and compassion, embracing sacred value systems. This, how we did it was uh, in trauma healing, we found out that uh, there were traditional systems that used to be in place before in the Somali context that used to bring people together, that used to bring close uh, families and, and communities close to one another that used to sympathize and empathize with communities in case of any conflict and all these things. So we had to reinvent and reintroduce those systems that have, have been long gone to, to make sure that we, we try to use those systems, indigenous methods to, to, to bring uh, peace. One of the systems that we used was the Abai Abai uh, trauma healing framework. The Abai 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 means sister, sister. Abai means sister in Somali language. So the sister, sister trauma healing method was this is a, an initiative of resolving conflict through local and informal trauma healing frameworks. In, in other words, uh, the Abai Abai is a traditional event uh, where a group of women or groups of women, most of whom are who share kinship, come together and share about existing grievances before agreeing on a resolution framework. And this was a system that was there. It's a place where people used to come together. It's an event that women come together. They talk about their grievances, they talk about their issues. And sometimes they bring in the issues of community issues other than the, the family issues. So events are associated to revive cultural practices associated with offering blessings to the pregnant women. The Abai Abai initially was only done for the pregnant women. Like the, the what is it called? In the modern ways it is called the, uh, uh, baby shower, something like that. So this was like the baby shower of the Somali community. So in, in Somali language, it is called madashup, whereby the women come together, they oil their hair together for, for each other. They, 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 they add, they, they put incense to one another, they oil their hair, they hug one another, they embrace one another, and they talk positive about 
the whole thing. So this was the Abai, Abai system. And so as Wuhawenka, we changed this system to we modernize it so that it can be able to, 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 to be used as a trauma healing uh, peace, peace building mechanism for the community. And that has, it has really worked in the whole of Northern region. Yeah. And the issue of sense of belonging, uh, the intervention is linked to community protests, military interventions, leading extradition. You know, the use of these modern ways, the extrajudicial killings, the military operations and all these things used by the, the, the government in terms of uh, at, at, um, attacking and, uh, and, and, and facing the Al-Shabaab and all these communities. This we saw that was not helping the community. So Hawenka successfully captures the hearts of the co local community by introducing this long time system, indigenous systems. And this has been welcomed up to today and this is what is working there. So Hawenka successfully captures the hearts of the co local communities through the power of mourning as an entry point to challenge the violence are among and against the communities. So we were trying to mourn with the communities that were affected, the clans that were affected. So the strategy, this strategy reaches the communities where, when they are most hurting. So this was how it was welcomed. Uh, as you can see those clips, I don't know whether you can see, this is uh, when you are seeing people hugging one another, this was at the trauma healing by a uh, ceremony events that we were doing for inter-clan conflicts. Uh, the, other, uh, the other system that we used was embracing sacred value systems. As I have said, we introduced the systems and the cultural system that used to be there. Some of the systems, the interventions here are associated with a strong link to the powerful cultural and religious values that are occasionally taken for granted by other formal interventions. Formal interventions do not see this as systems that help it, were helping, but we made sure aggressively we brought it back to the elders to the religious leaders to the women and the youth and it has been embraced so these sets of interventions are captured in how indigenous women have accosted conflicts that usually arise because of negative politics including tackling violent extremism to enforce political agreements indigenous women have worked in collaboration with religious leaders and the council of elders to set rules and procedures based on sacred values beyond the signatures on paper. This really helped. And this is how the elders and the religious leaders really welcomed us and supported us. And today we are we work together jointly. Uh, the other issue is how uh, overcoming the barriers to peace building. As I have said earlier, given the obstacles against women, like the superiority placed on the elders, the indigenous women have, have always taken notable risk of being reprimanded, remained bold on their resolve and enhance their determination to confront some taboo means. The elders never wanted us there. They never wanted us to get involved, but we made sure we worked strong. We made sure we, we, we aggressively talked to them positively, trying to work with them so that they had to, they had to accept us and to be part of the, the conflict peace building uh, mediators. In many cases, the interventions commenced with the, the, the defiance, that is, there was a lot of defense, then public demonstrations and ended in negotiations for collaboration or inclusion for all stakeholders. So how that was how everyone was brought on board, including the women in peace building. Some of the success stories uh, in local peace building, we have so many in Northern Kenya. We have the Modogashe Declaration that was signed in Garissa in the 2001 and later revalidated in 2005 and further reviewed on 8th of April, 2011. So this was a uh, Modogashe Declaration was uh, the hardest, the hardest of the communities, you know, Somali communities are pastoralists is moving with herders from one livestock from one place to another. So livestock were being moved from Mandera to Garissa, from Garissa to Wajia. And so there were used to be a lot of uh, frictions, conflicts and here and there. So the Madogesha Declaration was formed, was, was, was signed in 2001, but later on it had to come up to 8th of April, 2011. Sheikh Umar Accord, this is one of the, 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 the community the, the signed in Mandera between two communities, Gare Murule, that we, Hawenka, were really involved in in the year 2005. And then it was also revalidated in, on 8th of February uh, 2021, this year. This is, uh, this is uh, Sheikh Umar is a religious leader. So he was leading uh, 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 10 religious leaders from different parts of northern Kenya 
to come and solve the conflict that was between Gadda and Murule. As Haweka, we were part and parcel of this, uh, this accord. The Godia Ajura resolution that was signed on 13th of February 2021 in Wajir to achieve everlasting solution for the recurrent and prolonged feuds along the borders between Eldas and Wajir. No, this is in Wajir. These are two communities, the Barana and the Dogodia, who are always fighting. So this was also an Ajura and part of Hawenka. Our affiliates in Wajir were also involved in this, in this resolution. Uh, thank you, Amina. Um... You will see that much of the presentation, especially by Amina, is uh, talking, I mean, uh, is presented from a first person kind of approach. It means that uh, we are sharing direct experiences of Hawenka and where the success was. Uh, and so we have a lot to, uh, a lot to uh, learn from uh, this team. And so some of these uh, lessons that we can pick up or that we have documented, uh, it shows that women-led interventions based on indigenous knowledge have weathered the harsh terrain by confronting comparative victimhood and the historical injustices like extrajudicial killings. In many cases, um, many peace, uh, peace workers decided to fear confronting such kind of things. And so by being locals, knowing the the context of the region, uh, they had an advantage to understand the claims around victimhood. They had uh, also the experience to dialogue and deal with extrajudicial killings and by negotiating with the government. And so uh, we see indigenous knowledge setting a platform for the marginalized groups to raise their voices and to address violent conflict in an inclusive, functional, and sustainable manner. Uh, so key breakdown of such kind of lessons, one is the recognition on uh, that we need to make on what has always been treated as informal to, uh, by uh, uh, mainstream interventions like those supported by external donors. So we say, we're seeing a sense that recognizing the informal as formal is necessary to make a step. And so government and uh, donor agencies while focusing on what they treat as formal engagements have done an excellent job by involving the grassroots actors, but they often fall short of appreciating and learning from the monumental role of this kind of informality. And um, local contributions made by indigenous women in peace, peace building deserve to have huge space. Uh, so now, uh, the question that we would ask in this, when interventions by our international donors, by our foreign agencies, by the government, treat some aspects as being formal and others as being informal, then the big question that comes in, whose formality, formal according to whose parameters, and how does it fit into the beneficiary and the actor among the actor groups that need to register and sustain this kind of success of peace? It is the desire to uh, get the voice of those who experience it and who need that peace most. And so we get one voice from the community uh, saying that I suggest that the government agencies and the international organizations need to consider their viable local structures by building upon what exists already into the interventions rather than struggling to replace the indigenous knowledge systems with the Western tailored initiative. This is a woman, a uh, member of Hawenka, who sees that yes, as much as we get the support and as much as we get to learn a lot from the foreign interventions, they, we also have something from which they can learn. And so this is one aspect in which we can uh, have the two uh, moving together. So we also see interface between indigenous and Western knowledge, which means that they can work together. They can always move along. So instead of seeking to transform how the communities think and conceptualize issues of around conflict and peace, the state agencies and international donors would achieve a better result by advocating for and having a greater appreciation of hybridity beyond the limits of its negative connotations, meaning that there is no way that we would treat 
local knowledge, we will treat local perspective and subaltern voices as underdeveloped and things or issues that need to be developed when actually we need to work in, uh, hand in hand, uh, merging what is foreign and merging what might be scientific research or based on scientific evidence to local experiences. And so we get another interview uh, a, a voice saying that both international NGOs and government agencies should work towards building trust with the local communities. They should always leverage on the local knowledge for tailor-made programs to enhance acceptance and ownership of these initiatives by the local communities. And so then we get uh, to the last uh, lesson that we learned from this, which talks about defeating the victim tag against women. So um, in this case, the achievements claimed from the local engagement in peace building, uh, we see outshining the binary constructions that dominate literature, which often presents women and more so African women or women in African context of conflict uh, as the face of victims or as the face of poverty. Uh, and then poverty that leads to marginalization, that leads to all the forms of disadvantages. Uh, so we need to acknowledge the gendered strength of women as knowledge producers in this case, and more so the indigenous women as knowledge producers. Hence, by avoiding interventions or designs of such interventions that often overshadow uh, the supposed suffering of women. In this case, the evidence drawn from this research provides more insights that will be useful in challenging the dominant international discourse and uh, academic literature, which sometimes continue to focus on victimhood by instead reframing indigenous women as knowledge producers to be consulted and not being perceived as weak actors who are waiting to be assisted. And so we think with this kind of lessons, there is a big opportunity to have a focus that jointly would uh, enhance or show the importance of local peace building initiatives as we've learned from Hawenka. And with all that, we want to say thank you as we wait for any observation from the team. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present. Thank Back you. to you, Jeffrey. Terrific. Thank you both Amina and um, Sam. Um, <clears throat> very comprehensive, really just interesting and very valuable work that Hawenka has been engaged in. Um, over these many years. And, and those are some really interesting and invaluable lessons to take away. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is we'll move on to the next presentation, but for all of you uh, participating, if you, um, if you have questions that occur to you, feel free to write them in the, in the chat room and we'll we'll sort of collect any questions and, and get to them after the next two presentations. So again, thank you very much. And now we'll move to uh, Charles. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's uh, truly an honor to be um, sitting in this room with, with such uh, amazing um, peacemakers and peace builders. Uh, I, I find it to be uh, all too honoring to be up next. So thank you so much for that last presentation. Hopefully I can follow suit. Um, let's see if I can pull up my presentation here. Do you see my slideshow? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Charles Davidson. I'm a 2019 alum of the Carter School. I was the last cohort to graduate as SCAR, so there will always be a little bit of SCAR in my heart. Um, I'm now a uh, research faculty uh, focusing on, as Jeff said, the Political Leadership Academy, um, but I also maintain 50% uh, of my job is, is doing peace practice in, uh, in South Kivu in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I really could not ask for a better scenario being able to um, investigate uh, the intersection of local and international peacemaking actors, as well as the nexus of scholarship and and peace practice. I 
on the side when I close my laptop down at, at 5 p.m. as faculty at the Carter School, I, I open it at 501 as the president of Innovations and Peacebuilding International, which is um, my uh, uh, peace peacebuilding NGO that I founded 12 years ago. Um, my presentation today is strategies for new hybridity and peacemaking. In some ways, it picks up where the last presentation left off. Um, from my angle as an international peace builder, somebody who has had the opportunity to uh, travel the world, um, I've traveled to, researched in, and, and lived in several war-torn countries around the world, and um, my observations in my personal and professional life met with the scholarship of uh, my, my academic life, and the presentation today is about kind of a new um, strategy that we're developing in response to, to a lot of that. Um, that, that really investigates kind of a crucial point of, of a lot of people understand that there is a need for a turn to locals in, in, um, in peacemaking hybridity, but um, a lot of times it stops short, it stops short at well, how do we do that? Um, so that pr this presentation is about my current endeavors in, in investigating that from both practice and scholarship. Um, so as I said, I'm, in this presentation as well as um, where I'm at professionally investigates Peace scholarship and peace praxis. Uh, practice. I, I refer to it as praxis in this presentation. It's something I'm extremely passionate about. Um, in fact, me and Patricia Malden um, before COVID had an annual conference um, called the Praxis Conference, where people were coming from all over the world to talk about um, this intersection and and their locations. Um, but then also uh, the, the the donor um, Milt Lowenstein, who came to George Mason. Uh, in the beginning, the, the advent of this process, he, he asked, can we study um, and improve efficacy in local and international peacemaking partnerships, relationships um, known as um, hybridity? Um, so we all acknowledge a, a local turn. This isn't, this isn't a new concept. Um, we recognize that local peacemaking actors have to be out front. Um, they have to uh, direct, they have to strategize, they have to plan, execute, mediate. And, um, and, and reflect upon. Um, and we as outsiders should be there to accompany them. And there's lots of fantastic scholarship out there, books written, um, actually I have one right here. Uh, in my opinion, this is one of the best ones right now. The, international, the Interaction Between Local and International Peace Building Actors um, by Sarah, I don't know if you can see me, oh yeah, you can. Um, Sarah Hellmuller, um, fantastic book. But again, scholarship kind of ends there with, well, well how are we gonna do this? Um, this project, that we are working on in the Congo is attempting to both build peace in South Kivu and answer these questions. So these questions are not new, um, neither is the imperative to re-examine them. Uh, it's been talked about for a long time. Rather, um, next steps include in investing how, it, investigating, excuse me, that's a mis misprint, how to effectively implement strategies that acknowledge their conclusions, um, the conclusions of the local turn. Um, and uh, I think that it also necessitates a cycle of peace praxis um, where theories inform practice, but our practice is now growing theories where we're asking, how do we do this? Um, we're, we're testing it out in real time, but then writing new theory in, in how to go about peace building hybridity, peacemaking hybridity, both um, which, which I'm presenting today. My background very quickly, I recognize that, um, we'll see here. Jeff, will you give me a stopping point? Is it gonna be like 20 after 10? just so I can aim correctly. Yeah, that sounds 20 after is, is fine, but just, you know, keep going. We're in, we're in good shape. Okay, great, thanks. I do have my big computer over here, so I'm looking to the side if anybody's wondering why I'm looking off. Um, so a little bit about me, my background, and by the way, um, I have a presentation coming up uh, at 1.30 where um, it's going to be this 20 minute presentation is going to turn into an hour and 15 minutes. So if anybody's especially interested in um, my work and, and our studies, uh, it's gonna be presented in long form um, during, uh, yeah, during my own session at 1.30. So come check it out if you're interested. My background, um, when I was 20, uh, I went to a prison in Bolivia and um, it was on like a church trip and what I, what I saw was um, young children who were incarcerated with their parents, having done nothing wrong but nowhere to go, they were forced to live in prison. And this idea of children and the vulnerable be, uh, paying the price for other people's crimes really got stuck in my head. And so at 21 and from East Arkansas, 
um, having never traveled the world, I, I set out uh, to learn more about what was actually happening in the world, especially in co conflict affected areas. I went to my mentor at the time and said, I wanna start an organization that, that builds peace. And at 21, he said, what do you know about building peace? And what do you know about conflict countries? And I said, nothing. And he said, well, then leave and don't come back until you do. <laughs> um, and though I would never advise such an endeavor, and I, I make that clear every time I tell this story, I did, I did just leave. I started buying tickets to um, the most accessible war-torn countries I could, I could find, um, linking up with people who I had connections with through connections, through connections, and um, wound up uh, visiting or living in, working in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, Uganda, uh, Colombia, Lebanon, and others where I, I just went and I, I shut up and I listened to, to what people were doing. Because I was incredibly broke, young, and unexperienced, um, what I saw was sort of the outside in to the peacemaking community. And, and you know, I would be sitting, I lived in Afghanistan for a year where I taught English, and I would sit there drinking coffee with one of my students and a, and a convoy would drive by. And I said, oh, is that military? And they're like, no, no, those are the peacemakers. <laughs> I'm like, why do they have guns? You know, I didn't understand in my young mind, like what were these huge, like these industrial complex peace builders doing and why weren't they interacting with the locals? Um, and so that really informed my, my strategy. It, it was never an alternative. It was simply the reality that I came to see as the necessity for sitting down and drinking coffee with people who actually live there. Um, and so in 2015, my dreams came true. I got admitted to uh, George Mason University's SCAR and uh, could not believe I got into the PhD program and finished up in 2019 um, and then set back out through um, as research faculty um, having been equipped with practice and, and, and scholarship to, to do what I'm doing today. Um, and so what this all led to was uh, peace building initiatives that I built uh, along with my organization um, with local people around the world um, in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Uganda, Burundi, and then in 2015, we went to the Congo. It was here that I really became enamored with the idea of, of just how deeply impactful peacemaking can be if outsiders can be quiet and listen to local ideas, strategies, and, and measurements. Uh, um, these two gentlemen, uh, Terry on the left of the motorcycle, excuse me, David on the left of the motorcycle, Terry on the right, um, they contacted me and, and said, we heard you're coming to the Congo, will you also meet us? And uh, I said, sure, you know, who are you, et cetera. And, and they said, um, we're former child combatants who have started our own organization. And because um, we were in the militias, we have the ability to speak with the government and, and militia armed leaders about um, demobilizing young people out of the militia groups. I said, that sounds great, let's meet. And the next day, which was two days before I was to get on the plane to go to the Congo, they said, hey, we told all of the armed group leaders that you're coming, they want to meet you. <laughs> I said why did you do that? <laughs> why did you tell all these rebels that I'm coming? And they said, well, they, they just want to meet you. They want to find out, you know, what you're doing, what your thoughts are. I said, well, you know, if I'm going to build peace, I have to talk to the people who are fighting. So let's do it. So we drove out way, way out into the, uh, the bush in South Kivu and met with, um, as you see on the right, uh, several armed group leaders um, who were just there to listen and come to find out that indeed people who fight wars are in fact human. Um, and though they do commit acts of atrocity, there, we still were able to see um, just, just how deep the interaction between local peacemakers and, and local fighters really runs. Um, and so uh, I, I went on to have a, what is now seven years working experience with Terry and David. Terry unfortunately passed away from a heart attack um, last year. His life um, as a child soldier and, and peacemaker who was constantly under threat was, uh, was unfortunately, we think, too much for his heart to handle, and he did pass away. Um, and we, we honor his, his legacy and his memory in our work. Often, uh, we, we've named our largest project after him. Um, it's called Terry's Project, uh, which aims to demobilize child soldiers directly um, as individuals. Um, David can, has picked up the, the torch, and he has acted upon his ability to work in the bush, as well as in presidential offices in Kinshasa and everything in between. <laughs> Um, so he's our main actor 
uh, the Carter School is is what got this all started. It was through the um, uh, the leadership and the guidance of, of Dean Alp Ozerdem that I was given this opportunity. And um, it's through his support that I continue to be able to have just what is the honor of a lifetime in doing this work as research faculty at, at my dream university that I actually never had to leave after I graduated, which has been great. So we've, we've set out to ask how. Examining new approaches, we've experienced success um, in the following areas when, when asking how do we make the turn to the local? How do we step back as, as foreign peace builders, foreign peacemakers? And here's what we're testing. Um, and again, you'll get a much, much longer um, look at these variables if you come to my talk at 1.30. Um, so examining new approaches, we've experienced success in accompaniment, not placement of partnerships. So um, we as outsiders have to get it into our heads that even though we've been told we have to put the local out front, the idea of putting anybody out front is yet another way that we experience removing um, agency. Um, and so instead of thinking about uh, placing people, we think about ourselves as coming alongside them. Um, and the only way to really engage this we've seen um, is, is humility, number one, because there will be conflict immediately. If you're gonna have ideas um, that, that contest the, the local, you're gonna have um, strategies that seem differently. And, and what we have found is that if we can swallow our pride and actually test out this theory that 90% of the time the locals have been right anyways, um, that they know what's going on. And the 10% of the time where we've said, hey, look, we were right. Um, the way that you nurture that relationship is by uh, there being no, you know, no real consequence because um, unfortunately, bullet point number three, um, what we see, especially in books um, like Sarah's, is that while there may be the implication um, overtly that money will not uh, play a part in who is in charge, if we come in and say, hey, we're, we're, we're submitting your ideas, um, ultimately what's unspoken is that if, if you disagree too much with the funder, the funder leaves. And so what we've had to do is show them time and again that, hey, we're not going anywhere. Even when your ideas are wrong, even when we misstep, um, we're here, there's no punishment, we, you know, we're here to stay. Um, we also have to accept the reality that we're coming from the outside. Uh, we do not know these conflicts like they know them, we have not lived them. And so we, uh, we embrace the, the idea of the word accompany. Um, working with government despite the costs. Bullet point number two, listen, this is, uh, <laughs> in the Congo, this has been a doozy. Um, because you know, you're bumping up against systems that have perpetuated for 30 years. Um, what we have found is that the government is always our biggest cost. Um, and so we've been really tempted in the past to simply say, hey, we're not gonna, we're not gonna work with them and um, we're gonna do this in spite of them, et cetera. Uh, but, but the reality is that unless governments, and this is, this is not just a Congo play, this is, this is around the world, unless governments buy into what you're doing, it's not gonna succeed because they have the ability to turn it off just like that. Um, and so instead we, we decided, how do we, how do we re-examine our position with the government and the government's position with us? Um, because ultimately while they can you know, refuse the stamp as it were, um, they do have a lot to gain by these things succeeding, especially in our particular instance with um, the, pres the current president who ran on a, on a, on a, um, a billet of, of making peace in East Congo, our success is their success. And so when we, I'm sorry, my cat is, I don't know what my cat is doing, but she's being rather noisy and I apologize. Um, when we started experiencing overt and visible success in um, peacemaking, what we saw was the government stepped in and said, look at what we're doing. <laughs> and, and then they would call us secretly and be like, you better keep sending us money so we keep doing it. We're gonna show up to this, these conferences and, and I got so frustrated, you know, I'm like, we, we've been working for so long, sending this money and our partners on the ground have just been, just been um, hurting themselves with exhaustion. And yet now the government wants to come in with their, their big trucks and say, look at what we did. So I, I called um, who, someone who has become a, rather a, a mentor of mine, if, if not just kind of passively because he's an extremely busy man, um, William Urie. And, and I, I called William and said, hey, um, we, this is what's happening with the government, and this is this is wrecking my pride. I'm I'm extremely frustrated, and he said this is exactly what needs to happen. The government has to take responsibility for it, or there's not going to be any long-term peace. 
And he said, if they do take responsibility for it, then it, it forces the government to see it perpetuate should things go awry. And so you get them bought in because if they own it up front, then they'll own the possible failure later, which has been a really revelatory thing for, for me and, and, and our team. So we sort of step back and say, okay, we're gonna work with the government. Um, however, and this is a big however, and this is one of the main focuses of our project, re-examining the role and necessity of money. Um, <clears throat> Places like the Congo, especially Eastern Congo, have become beholden to um, NGO economies, right? Peace, peace land, severe no to say, right? It's, it's become a reality that, that um, is, is orchestrated, administered, and funded by outside donor agendas. And so money has come to play an odd role in what people expect in the peacemaking process. Things like per diem. Uh, where if, if I'm going to show up to your meeting, you have to pay me, right? Um, and, and it's not just pay me, it's pay me a lot of money to come participate, whether or not there's peace. And so when we jumped into this process, um, we recognized that meetings before ours um, had cost three to $400,000 to pull off a three-day meeting that, that we were going to, to attempt to implement um, in peace dialogue. And I said, you know, thinking about the ways that I had seen um, local economies and local actors behave in, in my past. I said, no, we're going to do it for one tenth of that and, and, and watch us work. <laughs> and I told the donor, I said, we're going to pull this off for $40,000. Watch us work. Um, and so when it came time to start distributing per diem and, and paying government fees, et cetera, um, we just said, no, <laughs> we're not going to, we're not going to do that. We'll happily pay you, um, you know, 40 or 50 bucks if you're going to spend three days with us for things like cell phone charges and, you know, taxis in town, but, but we're not going to pay you four five, six hundred dollars to come talk with us for three days. And then when it came time for the government to start asking for money, um, we simply said, we don't have it, which was true. We, our budget was $40,000. And um, I said, you know, I, I can't send you $3,000 for, you know, whatever fees that you're requesting because it's not there. And so um, if, if you need to put a stop to this peace talk, then, then go right ahead, I, and I understand. But what we found is that no one was willing to be that person to not give the stamp to the peace process. Um, and so it was a bit of a game of chicken and one that um, I think we could have lost several times, but ultimately did not. And what I'm starting to believe is that that actually is, um, is, a, is a new way to assess government involvement where um, you know, if they do want us to put a stop to it because of money, then we let them because uh, peace is not going to be possible if we have to pay for such um, rubber stamps, et cetera. Um, the necessity of direct involvement with current and former fighters is something that we are um, still working into. Is, is this an idea of how to do international peacemaking hybridity or is it simply a, um, a base foundation of peacemaking in general. Um, what we're finding is that the, the planning and the strategy that comes before the action, um, the more you can get present and former fighters into the process of planning and strategy, um, the more you have the ability um, to see success later based on their predictions of, of applicability. Um, Let's see here. Wow, I'm way over time. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of move on past uh, the rest. You can see we've also examined the nexus of women's lived experience, um, locally developed success indicators, and press coverage, and delineating output with outcome. Um, doing things that are difficult in war torn countries is not peace, <laughs> but doing things toward peace and then registering peace vis a vis local indicators um, is, is what we're strategizing towards. Um, I, yeah, I'm going to stop there. There's a lot more to say, but I have clearly gone over time. Um, Jeff, I'm going to hand it back to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Charles. And um, it's great that you will have the opportunity to amplify uh, all of these things later this afternoon. So uh, I encourage everyone that that is available then to to join that uh, join that session as well. Let's move quickly then to uh, 
Emmanuel, and um, uh, he'll give us a, another perspective with a different um, uh, case for us to consider. So Emmanuel, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to work with all of you and to learn from you uh, this afternoon. And so greetings from Accra, Ghana, where I am uh, at this point. Uh, let me say that uh, I appreciate the invitation to share reflections in the next few minutes on the importance of drawing lessons from local initiatives. And I want to emphasize the values that we derive from it. And uh, Charles and the uh, previous uh, presenters of uh, Hawaiinka have uh, in many ways uh, uh, spoken to this, and I'm going to amplify on that. And what I find fascinating is that it is in the local initiatives communities hold themselves in solidarity, regardless of what is happening in the larger scheme of things uh, in the conflict. And we must never underrate what these uh, initiatives mean to communities who despite and regardless of what is happening in a country and sometimes in a, a sub-region, uh, they are able to hold uh, one another. And the stories can never be well understood but that for me is the essence of our humanity. And in order to uh, move forward, in my earlier practice uh, from the East of Africa, there is this incredible story when in the Rift Valley of Kenya, violence broke out between uh, the Kalenjins and Kikuyu communities. And the uh, Kalenjins and the Kikuyus were in their own local setting doing everything to coexist within the bigger scheme of the political narratives that reinforce the conflicts between these two ethnic groups. And what would happen is how a Kikuyu family, almost at the point of the harvest, had to move away as displaced persons because the violence uh, was so threatening that they could not continue to live in their community. To cut that long story short, it was their neighbor, the opposite ethnic group, the Kalenjin, who after doing their own harvest, went onto the fields of their Kikuyu neighbor, harvested all the crops and kept them and waited until the violence subsided. And when their uh, Kikuyu neighbor, uh, who is supposed to be from an enemy ethnic group came back, they told them, this was your field, the crops that you grew, we harvested it and we kept it for you because we knew you would come back and you would have to sustain yourself. And this for me is one example of how communities are able to support one another in solidarity regardless. And I want to share very quickly some of the uh, experiences from uh, CAR, the Central African Republic, and to link basically how international support to local initiatives then becomes uh, very important. And, and, and Charles has been uh, talking about that. Now, very quickly, uh, whilst I talk, I'll be sharing my screen. And for those of you who uh, have probably heard and followed the Central African Republic, just one second. Okay, it's coming up. Yes. So what I, I, would, I would want to do is basically to start with a quick uh, chronology uh, that now will provide a, a, a background and then go into the substance and try to wrap it up with a uh, key lessons. Now, for those of you very familiar with uh, the Central African Republic, uh, Bozizi, uh, I don't want to go into the long history, but let's take it from where Francois Bozizi ruled for uh, 10 years between 2003 and 2013. And the reason I start from there is the dynamics that 
were generated under his rule. He basically was a president who used violent rep repression to fight off armed groups from the northern part of the Central African Republic. But the armed groups mainly from the Central African Republic were armed groups of Muslim, uh, so to speak, affiliation. There were armed groups that sprout out from various uh, Muslim uh, uh, groups. And so when it became a point in which uh, these groups and the northern part of Car felt excluded and felt marginalized, Seneca, a Muslim armed group emerged and marched onto the capital and took over political power from Bozizi. And in, 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 in reaction, as this march onto the capital was progressing, Bozize would mobilize uh, Christian militia groups, some of them animists, that was called the anti-Balaka, to fight back the uh, Seleka Muslim armed groups. Now, I start from this point to introduce the dynamic of religion and the instrumentalization of religion for political ends. And so what you would see is that in the same country, suddenly the element that is introduced is not just the fight for political power at the center, but also the polarization and division between the Muslim North and the Christian uh, South. But what this will do is that the Seleka became fragmented. They could not hold themselves together as a unit with a central command. And as they fragmented, they increased atrocities in the attacks on civilians. Then on the other side of the Antibalaka, they also were not coordinated, nor did they have their own central command uh, uh, systems. And so the Antibalaka, though they were looking at how resources were important, how to ensure that they had continuous dominance, the fight over the roots of uh, pastoral roots, transhumans, and also the fight around waterways, uh, some of them impacted by climate change, then uh, worsened uh, the situation of human security. Now, as you can see then on my slide, I start with the chronology. And so we fast forward. And so in this scheme, what was the preoccupation of the international community? They wanted as much as possible to support Central African Republic to go back to have a credible election. Because in the meantime, because the Seleka could not hold onto power, the negotiations ended with Seleka giving up political power for a transitional government led by Samba Panza. And that transitional government was to prepare for elections. And so I would then go to 2016, where the support from the international community was generous, and the United Nations played a very critical role, working with non-governmental organizations, the African Union, and ECAS, the Economic Community of Central African States, to ensure credible elections. So my first point, that in the nature of the conflicts in countries, uh, interstate conflicts, there is often the tendency to see elections as one key instrument that will end violence. But over and over again, it has proved not to be the case. And that sometimes elections could actually even exacerbate the type of conflicts that uh, people are experiencing. So the elections happened, and President uh, Faustin Ashang Tuadera, who is now serving his second term in office, was elected. But it was only a few months, a year and a few months later, that we would see in 2017 in May, a major and significant uh, incident in Car. This was the attack on Bangasu, a Muslim district in the town called Tokoyo. 
Now, I started by situating you in the Muslim, Seleka, and Christian and Tibalaka dynamic to relate to this attack. Because Bangasu had been peaceful regardless of the war that was going on in the country. But the shifting dynamic brought more and more Seleka towards this district of Bangasu. And in order to continue that war effort, as the Seleka were no longer in charge in the capital, they provoked, which is not the right word, for the lack of a better word, let me say, they provoked this anti-Balaka organization. And what then we we'll see happen is the attack. Eight peacekeepers were killed. And between 10,000 and 16,000 people were actually displaced. But the displacement happened in which the overwhelming majority of the internally displaced pitched camp on the premises of the Catholic Church in Bangasu. And so physically, you had a Muslim community uprooted and now living on the compound of a Catholic Church. And so what you saw happening was that the anti Balaka erected barricades to prevent humanitarian assistance to reach these internally displaced. And there were frequent attacks to try as much as possible and get to these groups and, and eliminate them. And so you see the intensity then of a religious conflict fighting itself within the context of a broader political conflict in Central African Republic. Now, the reason why this attack was significant is that it drew the attention of the United Nations Secretary General Special Advisor for the Prevention of Genocide, who went to Bangui, the capital of Ka, and proceeded to Bangasu to understand at first hand what was happening. Now, this is important because the threat and the potential for genocide was very uh, uh, plausible in the sense that if the anti Balaka was able to uh, get through the, the barriers and to attack the Muslim community on the church compound, there would have been a massacre. And that would have been a, a, a total disaster in a country with about 12,000 United Nations peacekeepers, blue helmets. And because of the reports that were generated, the Secretary General himself uh, moved on the day of international peacekeeping to uh, the, the country and to see at first hand what had happened in Bangasu. And so that gives you what you would call a flavor of how a local situation suddenly attracted such international importance for the Secretary General to go to a uh, car. Then we move to 2018, what happened? Now, it doesn't matter what we think about local initiatives, where there is the uh, capacity for international support. The question always is, who are the local partners? How are they credible? And what linkages are there to be able to provide that type of support? So if uh, Charles talked about his work, he had to rely on people in uh, the South Kivu district to be able to uh, do what uh, possible work he could do. In the context of Ka, we had a Muslim religious leader, uh, Imam uh, Kobine, and the cardinal, the head of the Catholic church in Ka, Cardinal Zapalenga. Both of them happened to come from that uh, district or prefecture as they, uh, they, 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 they describe it in French. And they decided, because they were also the two leaders of an interfaith platform, to initiate dialogue in Bangasu. But at this point, they were not looking for anybody to support them. They simply moved to Bangasu as citizens of that community who live in the capital and who are religious leaders. And what they did was to initiate uh, what you would call dialogue. And I'm going to uh, 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 move fairly quick to make sure I don't speak for too long for more time for questions. The point is, my second lesson is in local initiatives. Sometimes we should not be worried about the quality of an agreement that emerges from dialogue. What I admire about these two religious leaders 
was that they wanted to create the space for the type of dialogue that allows the community leaders to feel secure and to have that space to speak frankly and honestly. And that's what they did, airing all their grievances. And uh, in doing so, maybe what I could do is to come back here. I'll, I'll go back to my chronology. What emerged, and I would highlight them very quickly in passing, is that the agreement was not in itself such a good agreement. But what was important was that at the end of the day, they agreed to form what they called a follow-up committee comprising 24 members, bringing in women and different community leaders to form this uh, follow-up committee. It was at this point, they now wanted the type of international support and for the UN to pay particular attention. And that attention was paid in how do you support the follow-up committee and work with them to improve on the agreement that they themselves had developed. But as they were talking, there was a certain sense of a new confidence and trust building that was emerging. It allowed for FACA, which is the, the Force Zarme, the Santa Fe, which is the national army to be deployed. I happened to have been in Bangasu when the first hundred soldiers arrived. And the question then was, where are our leaders? Subsequently in September, the president would visit and you would see later on MINUSCA from the work that we started will now dedicate budgetary support to this work of the full up committee. I'm going to make that highlight as I go, as I conclude. But the, but the point here is to now uh, highlight what you see here in 2019. Now, what you see in 2019 is the, the signature of an agreement at the national level where the dialogue took place in Khartoum and where the 14 armed groups and the government signed a peace agreement. But all along, we now have about 300 internally displaced people in Bangasu trying to take the initial steps to go back to their own community in the town. And whilst this was happening, uh, 1,500 still remained displaced. And so I will go back now, pick it from the agreement that was reached and to highlight what were some of the key uh, points as I go towards conclusion. One, they wanted the reopening of markets so that people can interact in the marketplace, which is also a social space where Muslim women can interact with Christian women in a market space to buy vegetables and to buy fish and to trade. They wanted little small scale businesses to go back into operation. They wanted support to build their bridges of social cohesion, which was broken by the attack on the Muslim community. They wanted the barriers that had been erected all around, making humanitarian delivery more difficult to be dismantled. And that required an enormous amount of, of trust to ask for those barriers to be dismantled. And they wanted the facilitation of the return of the authority of state. And the physical return of the authority of state was the first 100 troops, uh, soldiers who went to Bangasu and to persuade the combatants to, post, to, to participate in uh, violent reduction programs that will continue to build the type of uh, confidence that was required. And they directed this to the government, to MINUSCA, in terms of how each of these will play a role. And so we should sometimes not be worried too much in our work about what quality do we see in a peace agreement. Because in the example of Bangasu, the recommendations did not involve the signatories themselves because they were projecting what they wanted to the UN and to the government. But keep in mind, they had a very weak government that could not go beyond the capital to exert state authority. Most of the recommendations were actually vague. They were not comprehensive enough. They did not address the root causes and there were no clear modalities of implementation. 
But what was important was as the 24 member follow up committee started to work, they started to improve upon this agreement and to see how that went uh, further. Now, I have highlighted the key aspects for the armed groups and this for the, uh, you would see for the government. I'll move quickly then to say so, how local is a peace initiative? And so, though we are talking about Bangasu, you will realize that first the, the religious leaders came from the capital because that's where they live. But that's where the members of parliament are. That's where the president is. So what is the linkage between Bangasu and the capital? And so the UN support was also to facilitate the linkage and the interaction. But since it was a peacekeeping mission, it had the assets to facilitate travel because you couldn't easily travel in the country. It took 14 days for a truck to move humanitarian assistance from the capital to Bangasu. But it's probably 45 minutes to an hour by a UN plane. And so the logistics support in itself could support the local community. Then the linkage between Bangasu and the armed groups. So that if you are talking about preparing a national dialogue, what does that mean at the local level in a community? And so you saw the bridges built between the local initiative and the armed groups. And you needed a similar linkage or brick building on issues about transhumans and the conflicts around pastoralist farmers and uh, agriculturists. And to that extent, look at the economic activities and how you offer alternatives, particularly to young people, to engage in sustainable livelihoods. And you now needed to look at the linkage with the international community and to begin to shift the mindset so you had Chinese mining companies who only wanted to mine, but they were not interested in, interested in what was happening in the community. You needed to engage them to understand that you cannot be exploiting minerals and simply look on passively at what is happening in the environment that you are mining uh, resources. The same thing with what uh, started to happen in the early days with Russian instructors with a Security Council exemption to train the Central African Army. How do you then engage and interlink? Then there was the French cooperation between the country that was now tinkering on, uh, uh, on a setting that was not well welcomed anymore because of the political dynamics and analysis. So whichever you looked at it, at the level of key actors from the international community, how do you build what was happening in Bangasu to these levels? And to that extent, the question then for the UN was, so how many local conflicts in a country and how many of them can the UN mission work with and support simultaneously? So I highlight Bangasu as one example, but there were similar examples elsewhere. And so the reflection in the UN was to begin to pay attention and place priority on how support for local initiatives was very important to achieve the overall objective of national peace in a country. Now, with the high turnover of staff, how do we get the required expertise to continue to support local initiatives? The idea of subcontracting local mediation, is that the way to go? What partnerships do you develop with NGOs and other partners to be able to sustain this? What are some of the difficulties to disperse funding to support some of these projects? And these then became part of the conversations that emerged. Now, in this last slide, and then I'll wrap up, I show you a picture in which the UN role begins to demonstrate support in which the blue circles are high level UN officials who went on the day the community agreed to commit and to sign on to peace to support the local communities who initiated the process. So this is Cardinal Zapalenga. Then you have the Muslim leader who sadly passed on uh, during the COVID, uh, during the pandemic. And you have some of the women leaders. You have the mayor, uh, the mayor is here. You have some of the uh, uh, Catholic priests and other religious leaders, but all of them together as one community now started to get a type of support from the UN. Now, when I say the UN here, 
I need the UN also bringing in other international partners in the type of cooperation that the international community then could provide. And this then is a, a picture that resonates with that international support to the local level. I conclude now with some key lessons. We need to continue to build on local peace processes. And when we are doing that, we need to take into account and uh, I liked it when Charles said, learn from local communities. And sometimes there is a certain attitude to suggest that because it is local, it is not as relevant as national. And I want us to turn that around and to say that the, the local initiatives actually make what is national to look more legitimate. So we need to do that. We need to ensure that whilst we are engaging, we are also thinking creatively about uh, viable alternatives. We need to be able to ensure that pe local peace processes are linked with local leaders that are government and local leaders that also are in national government so that those linkages can help to sustain the local initiatives. And I already talked about the key linkages, but we need to also ensure effective coordination. And in the example of Bangasu, sometimes coordination was difficult between what was happening in Bangi and what was happening on the ground uh, in Bangasu. So the UN had to play a pivotal role of helping coordination, including the type of logistic support that brought about coordination. And whilst the UN did this, it also took into account how to keep armed groups out of the town in order to create the safe spaces for the communities to continue to meet and for the confidence building to be enhanced. Funding support is important. And so as a result of the work we started uh, with the type of mediation support to try to persuade the mission leadership to have a dedicated budget in support of the local peace process. And that started to help facilitate meetings, make sure that the community leaders can travel from their villages into one central part of the district to be able to meet. And as we do that, we see that over time, confidence begins to build and the situation begins to improve. I've already sp uh, spoken for more than 10 minutes. Let me stop here. And if there are questions, I can come back and clarify. Thank you so much, Jeff. Great. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. That was a, a terrific example of the, the connection and links between the local and the national. And um, uh, really a, a, a just a fascinating and very instructive case. Um, uh, we just have a few minutes for, uh, for questions and, and winding up. So what I think I'd like to do is um, uh, pose a question to each of you uh, because it reflects something that, that you all talked about um, and then also um, enable you to make any um, final or concluding remarks. And, and the question that, that occurred to me was the, the value and importance of local peacemaking efforts um, can become, and, and you, in both Samuel, Amina, and, and then again, Charles, made the point that there's so much that international donors or donors in general can learn from locals. And it's really critical that local peace building, peacemaking efforts not be token, not just be pushed out front in the name of sort of uh, local participation. So I guess, and then looking at the, the Banga Sioux example is that the success of really investing in, in local um, so I guess the question I would have is what makes for meaningful local peace building initiative that is not just sort of a function of what the donors are doing, but that can help transform the donor approach to peacemaking so that there's not just the face of, or as I think Charles put it, sort of pushing the locals forward, but what is it that can make for really, what have you found that makes for meaningful 
local participation in which the donors themselves can change uh, and adapt to this importance of, of the role of locals. Uh, so I'll, I'll go around to each one of you in, in both, if you could respond to that and then just any final concluding remarks. So I'll start with you, Samuel. Uh, thanks very much, Jeff, and uh, to everyone else. I think uh, it's very fascinating how uh, we have great intersection between uh, the studies on the so-called local. And i um, really impressed by how Charles is bringing out how local, and then we get almost like uh, an answer that uh, comes through Emmanuel's presentation. Um, I would want to answer this uh, by uh, uh, showing the process of what we call intervention in the local communities. Uh, there is a situation of uh, peace building that is always silent and subtle. And this identifies what local is. That is the peace building between neighbor to neighbor, as Emmanuel was putting it. There is a peace building on continual basis, which does not wait for designing of a project and for reporting of activities. That is the process that describes the lived lives of real experience of conflict and how they are resolved. This is what defines the local. Now, when donors come on board, the situation shifts from that reality to an aspect of feasibility and contemplation where we design interventions in the international cities. Like we would be designing a program for Nairobi in Washington. Good. Then we request those who are interested in whatever has been designed in Washington to apply for that support. And so Nairobi people working on peace building will be interested and express the, uh, 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 their interest. While all the violence, all the conflicts and all the peace happens in the local, local subnational region. And so Nairobi or actors in Nairobi are applying for this on behalf of the subnationals who are in Mandera like for Kenyan situation, because they have the proximity to the donors, because they have the language to respond to the proposals required. And so whom we refer to as the local, who deals with the, lives and deals with the conflicts on daily basis is left behind. And then we do things for them. And once this kind of approach comes to the local, the very subnational, the very uh, uh, grass region, it becomes more of tokenism, or we are assisting you, and therefore you play to the gala. You have to show us how you are going to respond to the indicators of this program. So then we report based on our theory of change. Now, that is where the nexus breaks, that everything is superficial, and they're supposed to be accounted for. Why? Because that which is local, that which is continual, that which is not documented and cannot project on the indicators is treated as informal. So what do we say from this study? That uh, it is significant to accept that whatever is going on on the ground before we design for any program wherever the donors are is more prominent. And therefore, if we have the donor strategy that would be willing to learn from what is going on and ask those who will not be able to write that proposal where they think they need this support. It can't be technical support. It can't be 
financial support. It can be advisory element. And this is where we talk of hybridity that acknowledges the principle of local knowledge production system. And that which does not see the locals, the indigenous as underdeveloped. Roger McGinty says this very well, that we need to acknowledge that that which is local is not necessarily underdeveloped. And so it is this nexus that the donors need to accept and appreciate so that we don't deploy experts to a people who are experiencing their own problems. How can you be an expert in my own problems, in my own life, in my own locality, and you are in Washington? And it is me who might be an expert on my own problems. And so you have to, you have to give me a way of explaining this to you. If I don't have the language to say it, then you learn by seeing or observing what I'm doing and how it can be done. And then you come in to support what you think can work. That is the next that we are talking about in Hawaii. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Charles. <clears throat> Well, I have the privilege of speaking about this in the same room as my donor, so <laughs> I'm going to uh, call uh, attention to the fact that Lawenstein is joining us here today. Um, but certainly, um, there is, um, th I think there's a couple of different tacks to answer this question. Number one, uh, are you working with a government or are you working with an individual? Um, uh, and that, I think that also includes foundations and things like that. We're discovering the motive uh, rather than assuming the motive uh, behind the investment is something that we as a kind of the middlemen have to discover before setting out. And I also think not uh, assuming that you have to take an apologetic attitude toward the, the motives of the donor. Um, one thing that came up during the ISAs last week when I was presenting uh, is the challenge of, you know, coming against, I think, tradition and uh, the way we've always done it when it comes to stewarding government money, what we oftentimes don't realize is that uh, if, if we're going to demand that the system change as far as turning to the local and, and discovering new ways of how to turn, um, we can say all day that, you know, we trust the local, we're going to put our um, you know, capacity behind them and accompany their ideas and even submit to them when we disagree, uh, which is great. But what happens when we forget that it's the, the American taxpayer or the Dutch taxpayer or the Swedish taxpayer, whoever the donor is, um, that actually is the ones who are approving these ideas. And so we, um, I think that it's, it's going to be a, like a long haul deal. It's, it's not something where, hey, we have this revelatory idea and we're going to change the way we do um, the nexus of international local hybridity. Um, and then I think the same idea applies to the individual or the foundation where, you know, for me, I always, you know, went to um, individuals kind of hat in hand saying, you know, whatever it is you want us to do, we'll, we'll make it happen. But what I realized in working with um, as seasoned a donor as Milt, um, is that it, it's okay to disagree. <laughs> and, and it's certainly even better if we employ our conflict resolution skills with that relationship between the, the, the acting partner and the donor, um, where instead of just submitting to um, the donor's ideas, the donor's functions, we say like, um, what is it that you want? What is it that we're trying to discover? And how can we work well together? And as Milt and I um, have so often done, discussing where we meet uh, actually presents the strength of, of what we're attempting to do. And so it has so often been that uh, I tell Milt, thank you so much for disagreeing with me <laughs> because uh, we, we do grow together. And, and so, yeah. Great. Emmanuel, we'll let you have the last word. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey. I think my uh, previous two colleagues have said it much better than I will say it. And I want to, uh, uh, so, so to speak, re-echo it. And uh, Samuel and Charles, basically the, the, the interconnections you have made is precisely what has informed 
the United Nations system to think differently about support. So if you look at Bangasu, it was happening in the context of international peacekeeping. And the mandate of international peacekeeping missions would normally have implicitly in different ways of formulation, the protection of civilians. Now, how do you protect civilians when the civilians who are divided in the example I gave cannot engage with one another locally? But are you the one going to go and leave that experience for them? No. So the protection must then take into account what Samuel described as allowing the people to leave their lived experiences. I remember I uh, almost became so emotional when we finished a meeting in Bangasu and I saw the Muslims walking alone and then the Christians walking on the other side. And this was after we left the, it was like the town hall. And I went out and I told them, why don't you teach the rest of us in the world? that despite what has happened, when we come back to the, your community and we see you walking together, we will not know who is a Muslim walking and who is a Christian walking, because that is your life that you must live. And that is basically what the local initiative was about to do. And so if, uh, for those who are interested, if you go to uh, the website, peacemaker.un.org, there is a publication uh, from November 2020, in which UN support to local mediation, uh, we contributed to a, a paper with case studies and the one in of Bangasu, which we contributed to write uh, from my work. It's all there. You can look at Myanmar and other examples. And to say that Samuel and uh, Charles, I think this afternoon for me has been so brilliant. And what we need to do is to amplify this and then make the linkages with the funding community of peace making to see this as so, so important. And that the cumulative effect of that is the peace of the nation, the peace of the country and the peace of the region and not the other way around. And, and I, I want to, I want, oh, and maybe I should add this, that what Samuel described, the more the national dialogue went up to Khartoum, and the more it was perceived to be formalized, the more then it became much more difficult. And no wonder that agreement that was signed was so difficult to implement because the number of women who were leaders in their communities were excluded. And yet the idea was to bring that peace agreement and implement it at the community level. And no wonder after the agreement was signed, we went back into violence, uh, uh, towards the elections at the end of 2020. And in 2021, there has been a reduction and yet that peace agreement has not been fully implemented. So there is a lot of lesson from the local initiatives to even inform how national dialogue is happening with international support that brings key political actors. And I thought that would be in addition to what I have just said. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you to all three of our, our wonderful speakers. And I, I really appreciate Sam, you and Amina, as well as Emmanuel joining us all the way from, from Africa and uh, ending your day with us, uh, your work day. And uh, thank you all for, for joining us and uh, uh, participating. Um, and um, I hope you'll have another chance to uh, join other sessions in our Peace Week going forward. But this has been very, very rich and, and very instructive. And uh, uh, thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.